All right, let's uh, formally begin with the session. Uh, the objective of the session is to cover geometric progression. Uh, students are already clear with arithmetic progression. So our agenda of today's meeting is uh, our geometric progression. First, we will be discussing the concepts of geometric progression. And after that, we'll be doing past papers, which will, will be including arithmetic and geometric progression both, right? So let's start. Uh, arithmetic progression was a sequence in which every subsequent term was obtained by adding or subtracting something from the previous term. And as far as geometric progression is concerned, uh, a sequence in which any two consecutive terms has a common ratio. In arithmetic progression, there is a common difference. We call it D. And uh, as far as geometric progression is concerned, there is a common ratio, right? And the common ratio is called R. So the first term is A. The first term, the second term is AR. The third term is AR square. The fourth term is AR cube. What is happening? R is being multiplied. R is a common ratio. We can see R is a common ratio. And the common ratio is being multiplied. Uh, in, in AP, in arithmetic progression, the first term was A. Then we obtained A plus D. Then we obtained A plus 2D. Now, what is that happening? The common difference D is being added to every subsequent, every previous term. Every subsequent term is obtained by adding D to the previous term. Now, this D can be a positive number as well. Or this can be a negative number as well. So if this D is a positive number, then addition is taking place. And if D is a negative number, then subtraction is taking place. Similarly, First term is A, second term is AR, third term is AR square. This, mean, this means R is being multiplied. Now, if R is like, uh, let's suppose R is 2, then the numbers would be increasing. And if let's suppose R is 1 upon 2, then the numbers would be decreasing. What I mean to say is that uh, when D was positive, addition was taking place. When D was negative, subtraction was taking place. Now over here, when R is a number greater than one, let's suppose. So this means multiplication is taking place. And if R is a number between zero and one, currently we are focusing on positive common ratio only. So if the common ratio is positive and it is half, then this means division is taking place. Because multipl multiplication by half basically means division by two. Someone says multiplying 24 by half, or we can also say 24 is divided by two. Both means the same. 24 multiplied by half is 12, and 24 divided by two is also 12. So uh, addition subtraction is covered in AP, arithmetic progression, and division multiplication is covered in geometric progression. But the thing is that we multiply R, just, just like we used to add D, Similarly, we multiply R over here. This means in geometric progression, every subsequent term is obtained by multiplying a certain ratio to the previous term, right? So multiplication division is GP, addition subtraction is AP. Now we have different formulas for AP. Similarly, we have different formulas for GP. The first thing that we have to cover is term. Now we can look, look at the example and then we'll be applying the formulas, the formula for term is to obtain a particular term, the formula that is followed is a r power n minus one. So let's suppose if the value of n is one, this means first term. So we can substitute and we'll we will be obtaining a r one minus one, a r power zero, the answer is a. And, and we know that the first term is a. So if n is two, then term n a r power two minus one and we'll be getting AR. So we can see the first term is A, the second term is AR, the third term is AR square, the fourth term is AR cube. And let's suppose if we are going to find the fifth term directly, then the formula for fifth term would be AR power five minus one, which means AR power four. So fifth term, the power is four. Second term, the power is one. Third term, the power is two. So the power is one less than the required term we can assess this because the formula is AR power N minus one. 
Now let's take an example. Uh, first term is two, then comes four, then comes eight, then comes 16. And we can see that every subsequent term is obtained by multiplying a certain number to the previous number. Every subsequent term is obtained by multiplying a certain number, a certain ratio with the previous number. So in this case, we can see that the first term is two. Now, how can we obtain a common ratio? To obtain the common difference, the formula that was followed was subtract any two consecutive term. So T2 minus T1, or we can say T3 minus T2. Similarly, to obtain the common ratio, the formula that we have is T2 upon T1, T3 upon T2, T10 upon T9. What, what, does, what does this mean? This means that any two consecutive terms can be divided to give us common ratio. But for that, we should be have two consecutive terms. We should be having two consecutive terms. We should be having fifth or sixth term, or let's suppose we have 10th or 11th term, or let's suppose we have 50th and 51th term. If you have two consecutive terms, then we are going to divide them and we'll be getting the common ratio. So common ratio can only be obtained when we have two consecutive terms, right? And what is the formula? If you have, let's suppose 10th and 9th and 10th term, then T9 upon 10, T10 will not give us R. T10 upon T9 will give us R. This means the new term divided by the previous term. Any, if there are two consecutive terms, then the last term would be divided by the previous term. So this means if we have T1 and T2, then it's T2 upon T1. If we have term 2 and term 3, then it's T3 upon T2. If we have 9th and 10th term, then it's T10 upon T9. So it depends which two consecutive terms we have. The later term will come in the numerator and the previous term will come in the denominator, right? So if uh, let's suppose we have so many terms in this example and we have to find the common ratio, what we are going to do, we are going to divide any two consecutive terms. So let's suppose if we are going to divide the second term by the first term, the answer is four upon two, the answer is two. Or we can also divide uh, one, two, three, four, the fifth and the sixth terms the answer would have been 64 upon 32. The common ratio would again be two, right? So any two consecutive terms that can be divided to give us R. So A is the first term, R is the common ratio. We have understood first term, we already know this. We have covered the general term formula. Let's suppose if we have to find the 10th term in this sequence, then the formula would be A R power 10 minus one. This means A R power nine. So if the sequence is the same that we have taken in this example, the first term is two, the common ratio that we have got is also two and the power is nine. So this would mean two multiplied by two power nine and we'll be getting the 10th term in this sequence. Two into two power nine and the answer is 1024, right? Here we have covered the nth term formula. Now let's look into the sum of first n terms formula. The good news is that be it AP or be it GP, the formulas are already given in the formula sheet and the formula sheet is basically known is known as MF19 sheet that will be provided to you in the examination and uh, you'll just be uh, you, you will just have to apply the formulas but it, it's always good to remember the formulas because uh, sometime or the other they can be used and looking at the formula sheet again and again in the examination under pressure might seem to be difficult at times so it, it's always better that you have memorized the formulas however Still, just for your safe side, the formulas are given in the formula sheet that will be provided to you in the examination, uh, right? Now comes the sum of first n terms. The same thing we have already seen in arithmetic progression. The sum is n upon 2, 2a plus n minus 1d, n upon 2, a plus l. We have two different formulas and both of them can be implemented to find the sum of n terms. Similarly, the formula that we have of sum over here is a multiply by one minus r power n, right? Let me uh, change the font size. I can, I guess it's visible. So it's a uh, one minus r power n upon one minus r, right? Uh, before we discuss sum to infinity, let's uh, take an example of this. Let's suppose how many terms are these? This is first, two, three, four, five, six, six terms, right? 
six terms of a sequence are given. An examiner tells us find the sum of first six terms. The formula would then be a multiplied by one minus r power n upon one minus r. Now the the thing that you have to note over here is that the power n is just on r and not on the entire bracket. Now it could be one minus r whole brackets closed power n. It's not like that. The power n is just on r. You can see that clearly. The first term is two. One minus r. R is again two. Power n. N would be because we are finding the sum of six terms. Then n n would be six divided by one minus r. And r is two. So if we are going to use the formula the, of sum, the answer that we are going to get will be one twenty six. So if just manually, if we are going to do that. Then two plus four is six. Six plus eight is fourteen. Fourteen plus sixteen thirty. Sixty-two. Sixty-two plus sixty-four is one twenty-six. Even if we are going to manually add all the six terms, we'll get the same sum. And if we are going to use the formula, <coughs> which is of course a shortcut to find the sum, then still we are getting one twenty-six as our answer, right? So we have covered uh, and we have implemented the sum of first n terms, the general term. And uh, wait, yes, something different that is happening over here. This is changed. Just give me a minute. A R power n minus one. Right, perfect. So it was uh, firstly we covered that. A general term formula, the n term formula. Then we understood what the common ratio actually means. Then we understood how the common ratio is found. Then we uncovered some of our sentence. Any any confusion that you have up till here, please highlight. Or if everything is clear, just write in the chat box that we are clear with it. All right. Do I need your acknowledgement? You are clear with it. That. All right. Perfect. Uh, let's move forward. Sum to infinity. Now this is a different concept because uh, sum to infinity is not in arithmetic progression because it does not exist over there. Sum to infinity is a concept that we have to understand. That we have to understand properly because it's a concept that solely belongs to geometric progression and not to arithmetic progression, right? Sum to infinity, uh, we like write like this: sum to infinity. This is the sign of infinity, right? This is the sign of infinity. So if you have to find the sum to infinity, then the formula that that we follow is a upon one minus r. Now, how this formula is derived is none of our business. But of course, it has been derived using the sum of n terms formula. I'll definitely be telling that as well. But what is the concept behind sum to infinity is something that needs to be understood, right? This is very important because sum to infinity on only exists for a convergent geometric series. Uh, up till here, if you are clear, please take a screenshot. We are moving forward, so I'll be uh, scrolling down the screen. Just take a screenshot if you have not already done that. <clears throat> sum to infinity says sum to infinity is a upon one minus r, where r should not be equals to negative one, one and zero. Similarly, uh, one thing that we must be aware of already is the common difference should not be equals to zero, because if the common difference is zero, then there would be no sequence. Common difference has to be a positive number or a negative number for sure. But common difference can never be negative. Similarly. In geometric progression, the common ratio can neither be negative one, nor be one, nor it can be zero. So it should not be negative one, one and zero. It can be any number other than that, but it cannot be negative one, one or zero. Why? Why so? Because let's suppose if a sequence starts like this two, and then uh, if r is negative one, and if we are going to multiply r by a first term, the second term would be negative two, then again two, then again negative two. So the sequence is not the sequence is not proper. Similarly, if r is one and if first term is two, it will keep on repeating itself. And if the common ratio is zero, and if you are going to multiply, 
then definitely the answer would be zero because if the first term is two, then the answer is zero and the answer goes on zero, zero and zero. So all three sequences are wrong. So this means R can neither be negative one, nor it can be one, nor it can be zero. So it should not be negative one, one and zero, right? So if uh, in examination questions we are solving and we are getting the value of D as zero, we are going to reject it. And similarly, if we are going to get the value of R as negative one, one or zero, we are definitely going to reject these values of R because uh, <coughs> these are not the correct values. Uh, then sum to infinity says that uh, note derive sum to infinity formula from sum of first n terms formula. Now, how can this be derived? Uh, we will learn later. Uh, although it's not mandatory, but I'll I'll be covering in just two three minutes about uh, how to convert so that we have a very clear idea of, about how sum to infinity formula is derived. Secondly, sum to infinity does not always exist. It only exists in geometric progression. And second thing is that it only exists when the series is convergent. This is a very important point, right? It only exists when the series is convergent. So this means series has to be convergent. Now, here comes the question, what convergent actually means? What is the meaning of convergent? What are you trying to say, sir, when you are using the word convergent? So convergent actually means the common ratio R lies between negative one and one. Or we can also say that the common ratio R lies between zero and one. The broad condition must be kept in mind. And that is for a series to be convergent because sum to infinity only exists for a convergent geometric progression, right? So for a sequence to be convergent, for a geometric progression to be convergent, the R must lie between negative one and one. And this condition applies when no indication is given. What, what do I mean by no indication? By no indication, I mean that it has not been delivered, uh, it has not been communicated by the examiner as to whether the terms are positive or negative, nothing communicated. It's not specified the terms are positive or negative. But let's suppose if the examiner says, or if the sequence is given, let's suppose a sequence is given and a given sequence has two consecutive terms given, two consecutive terms are given, two consecutive terms means first and second term given or third and fourth given, given or ninth and tenth given, any two consecutive terms given and both of them are positive or both of them are negative. Now, how is it possible that if you are multiplying a common ratio R by the previous number to obtain the new number, both consecutive terms are positive. So both positive, both terms are, both consecutive terms are positive or both consecutive terms are negative. This means that common ratio is positive. So negative one to one is a very broad condition, right? If I'm going to draw a number line, a negative one, zero and one. Now the convergent is from minus one till one. This is the condition for a convergent series. And this condition will apply when no indication has been given by the examiner. However, if the examiner has given two consecutive terms and both of them are positive or both of them are negative, this means there's no difference of sign in both the terms. If the first, if two consecutive terms are given and both are positive, this means signs are same for both terms. And if both are negative, then also signs are same for both the terms. What does this mean? This means the common ratio R itself is positive because had it been negative, the signs would have been different. So this means the common ratio is positive. So two consecutive terms given, both positive, both negative, this means common ratio positive. And then if the common ratio is positive, then the out of the uh, broad condition of conversion from minus one till one, only zero till one will be the condition that will apply. This means R will lie between zero and one. If the series is convergent and if the two consecutive terms are positive or the two consecutive terms are negative, this means the common ratio is positive because common ratio is something that is multiplied. And if something is multiplied and the sign is not changed, then this means the ratio itself is positive. And ratio itself is positive would then mean that the entire condition minus one to one is not valid in that case. In that particular scenario, the condition would then be zero till one. However, if 
the two terms have different signs. Have different signs. This means, let's suppose first term is positive, the second term is negative, then third would. I am just talking about two terms at the moment. Or if let's say the first term, first of the two. Uh, the two consecutive terms are given and the first of them is negative and the second of them is positive, then also means that the common ratio is negative. If the two consecutive terms are given and the signs are opposite, then this definitely means that the common ratio is negative. So in that case, the second part, negative until zero will apply. This means R in that case lies between negative one and zero. I repeat this once. Normally, the condition for convergence is minus one till one. If the examiner has not given anything in the examination question, if there's no indication and nothing has been communicated, then if the condition of convergence is asked or if it is to be applied, then the convergent series has the common ratio between negative one and one. However, if in a particular scenario, it has been specified and the two consecutive terms are given to us and those two consecutive terms are positive or both of them are negative, then this means the common ratio is positive in which case out of the entire condition of convergence from minus one till one, the entire will not be applicable, but only the part from zero till one will be applicable. And so this would mean that common ratio basically in that scenario lies between zero and one. However, if the two consecutive terms have different, different signs, this means it is possible that the first term is positive and the second is negative, or the first is negative and second is positive. Uh, basically, if the two consecutive terms have different signs, then this definitely means the common ratio would have been negative, in which case the, uh, the condition of convergence would then be minus one till zero. So the entire condition minus one to one is, uh, is divided into two parts, minus one to zero and zero to one. Nothing indicated, the entire condition applies. And if certain scenario has been given in the examination question, then a particular part of it will be used in that particular question. Now the question, the, the questions that we have in the examination questions are not much about it. However, there are two, three questions uh, which have come with, along with trigonometry. Like although the topic arithmetic geometric progression is a separate topic and the, most of the questions are separate. However, the concept of convergence has been tested along, along with trigonometry. So the questions of uh, arithmetic progression combined with trigonometry and in that uh, the concepts of convergence have been tested. So that is why I have extended uh, the explanation of this particular concept because you are definitely going to face it in the future. And uh, at that point in time, it is quite possible that you might have faced problems. But now that I have covered it, there's quite possible that you might be able to uh, solve the questions by your own. And even if, uh, if the teacher is going to explain you something, you'll definitely be able to recall this explanation at that point in time, right? So just acknowledge if you have understood the concept of convergence so that I can move forward, just need an acknowledgement because it was a difficult question, a difficult concept. I just need acknowledgement on chat of yours. <clears throat> right now if we look at the example why do we call it sum to infinity what is the concept behind it sum to infinity is known as sum to infinity because if in that particular sequence, if we are going to take thousand terms as well, and if we are going to add all those thousand terms, there's a certain value which can never be reached. This means sum to infinity actually means if we are going to add infinite terms, if we are going to add infinite terms of that sequence, we will never be able to achieve a particular sum. Now that sum is known as sum to infinity, the maximum sum. Now the concept is a bit difficult to understand initially because it comes to our mind. How is it possible that if you are going to add 50 terms? Wait, let's think again. If you have 50 terms, we have to have a certain sum, right? Then if you have 60 terms, then our mind says the sum will be greater. If you have 70 terms, the sum will be greater. And as the number of terms increases, the sum will definitely increase. But for a convergent geometric series, there is a limit to where we can increase our sum and <clears throat> a particular limit when reached, the sum will never increase uh, beyond that. So if just I take an example of that, if the first term is A, which is two, and the, sec and the common ratio is 0.2, please note that over here, 
the common ratio lies between negative one and one. You can apply this to any scenario where common ratio lies between negative one and one, but it should not be negative one, one or zero. Between negative one and one, any value of r can be tested by your own. You can test it by your own, right? So if common ratio is 0.2 and first term is a two, then uh, the first term is a, the second term is a r. We will multiply a by r. So two into point two is point four. Then the third term is a r square a. Then comes a r. Then comes a r square. Then comes a r cube, right? And then comes a r power four. Then comes a r power five. And the terms that we have obtained are uh, given over here. Uh, if we are going to multiply r once, we will get 0.4. If we are going to multiply r five times, then the term that we'll get is 0.0064. So what will be the sum to infinity in this particular case? Let's look into that. Sum to infinity in this case would be, sum of infinity formula is also given. And the sum to infinity formula is a upon one minus r. As we can see over here, the sum to infinity formula is a upon one minus r. So if you are going to find it over here, two upon one minus 0 0.2, then two upon 0 0.8, two upon 0 0.8 would be 2.5. Now, what does this mean? This means that this convergent geometric progression is such that even if you are going to add 10,000 terms of this sequence, we'll never be get We'll, we'll never be getting the sum beyond 2.5. The sum that we are going to get will always be lesser than 2.5. It will never be 2.5 or greater than that. <coughs> sum to infinity is a limit that can never be achieved, that can never be reached. If you're going to test it, just test it over here. The first term, we have been given the first six terms. Let's add all together. If you are going to find the sum of first six terms, if you are going to find the sum of first six terms, let's see what the answer is 2 plus 0 0.4 plus 0 0.08 plus 0 0.016 plus 0 0.0032 plus 0 0.00064 and the answer is 2.49984. So we have got 2.49984. So now even if we are going to take, take 10 more terms and we are going to find the sum of 16 terms, it would be like this 2.49999984, something like that. But, but, but it will never be 2.5 or beyond that. Yes, if you're going to take the sum of 1,000 terms and 2,000 terms and 10,000 terms, a point will come when the calculator will say, sorry, I cannot give answer in further decimal places. I cannot give more decimal places uh, to this answer and will round it off to 2.5 itself. The calculator at one time will definitely give 2.5. Although, Conceptually, practically, the answer 2.5 can never be achieved, but there's a limit to the number of decimal places that the calculator can give. And it will, one, at one point in time, it will give us 2.5 as our answer, but the answer will never exceed 2.5. Conceptually, 2.5 can never be reached, but calculator has a limit. So that is why it will give 2.5 at one point in time, but the answer will never be beyond 2.5. Sum to infinity, we actually means that if you are going to add infinite terms of that sequence, the sum to infinity, <coughs> uh, the sum of all those terms will never be exceeding a particular limit. And that particular limit is known as sum to infinity, right? We are clear with it? Yes, definitely we are going to clear. We are clear with it. Just an acknowledgement about this example as well, and then we are going to move forward. Perfect. All right, then uh, comes the concept of percentages. Now, Musa, this uh, convergent thing is a bit different thing, definitely. But uh, I, th I think we should not waste for the time over here. I'll be sending the recorded lecture uh, later on. So you can just listen to it again. So. Anything that is not clear, I guess it might get clear at that point in time. Are we fine with it? Because I think uh, it's it will come in one or two questions along with trigonometry and right now not in the pure questions of uh, APGB. We can just, we might just see one or two questions about it. So the concept of convergence has been delivered from my end as far as I think. Uh, so if I'm going to send the recording of the lecture, I, I think you will be able to understand it. 
right musa or do you want me to clarify anything that that is bothering you sure perfect so we are moving forward right now whenever the percentages are involved this would mean that the series is symmetric now let me clarify this point this is very very important in certain questions it has been clarified by the examiner that this question belongs to arithmetic progression and this uh, question belongs to geometric progression but there are few questions in which it has not been specified by the examiner and we have to determine ourselves as as to whether this question is of ap or is it of gp so one particular thing that i have to convey over here is that whenever in a particular question percentages are involved whenever percentages are involved the question would be a geometric progression question i have written few notes uh sum to infinity formula has been derived using the original sum to n terms formula no need for the derivation because it's not required the only thing that we need to clear uh we the only thing that we need to be clear with is uh, what is the concept of sum, sum to infinity and what is basically the concept of convergence then <coughs> moving forward whenever there are percentages involved in a particular question geometric progression must be used now how will the percentages be given uh increase sometimes the examiner says increase of 10 if increase of 5% or 10% then in that case uh, the common ratio would be calculated as follows now this concept is very important so i'll be needing to clarify it increase of 5% means 100% plus 5% because increase of 5% means actual percentage was 100% there was a increase of 5% so this means that uh, we'll be getting 105% and 105% actually means 105 divided by 100 which if if converted into decimal would, would mean 1.05 that is why i've written that if there is an increase of 5% the common ratio would then be 1.05 and if there is a decrease by 5% if there is a decrease by 5% then decrease by 5% means uh 100% Minus five percent, hundred percent, minus five percent, which would mean ninety-five percent. If the percentage is ninety-five percent, then if we are going to divide ninety-five by hundred, then it would become ninety-five upon hundred, which actually is zero point nine five. The increase by five percent is one point zero five. Increase decrease by five percent is zero point nine five. and sometimes in the examination question uh, the words increase and decrease are not written but it's written 80% of the preceding year 80% of the preceding year in that case uh, 80% would itself be common ratio and 80% means 80 upon 100 which means common ratio is 0.8 now let me clarify this concept to you further because i am very sure that it, you are not very clear with it uh, rather than memorizing let's understand this concept let's suppose uh, let's take a basic calculation of the year mr a was earning 10000 dollar per year right mr uh, uh, mr a was earning 10000 dollar per year annum uh, now this amount increases by 12% per annum after one year mr a is given an increment by the company and now uh, after every year uh, he will be getting a 12% increment so if someone is going to ask me that if the first term in year 1 mr a salary is 10000 dollars right what will be the salary in year 2 so how will year 2 salary be obtained the first method is the common percentage method because we know that uh, amount is increased by 12% what we will do we will be applying 12% to 10000 then we will be getting 1200 And now, when we'll be get uh, adding twelve hundred to the previous value ten thousand, then we will be getting eleven thousand two hundred, right? Eleven thousand two hundred. The second year is eleven thousand two hundred. Now, this is method number one. Now, method number two is geometric progression. How come? GP says that if we are given the term one. We need to multiply term one by a certain value to give us term two. 
Now, what will that certain value be? So the concept of percentage tells us that if you are going to apply 12% to a particular value and then add to the original value, we'll get a particular answer. And the shortcut method is that if we know that the increase is 12%, we can simply say 100% was the original value, 12% is the increase, the new percentage is 112%, and the common ratio is 1.12. So this means if you are going to multiply 10,000, the previous value, with 112 percent, we will we'll, we will be directly getting the new answer, which is 11,200. So this means to obtain every subsequent term, every new term, the existing terms should be multiplied by 112 percent. And 112 percent actually means 112 divided by 100, which is 1.12. This means that whenever we are going to multiply by 1.12, we are going to get a new term. So if Mr. A says what will be the salary in year two? We'll multiply, we will be multiplying 10,000 by 1.2. 12%. Sorry, 1.12. My bad. 1.12. 1.12 means 11,200. Then again, multiply by 1.12. Uh, it would give 12,544. And this goes on and on and on. The simple thing that we have summarized is whenever there's an increase or decrease percentage given, this means geometric progression will be used and that increase or decrease amount will be used to find us find the common ratio. If it's an increase that that percentage will be added to 100% to give us the new percentage, which when divided by 100 will give us common ratio. And if there's a decrease, then we are going to subtract that decrease percentage by 100% to give us new percentage. And that percentage when divided by 100 will give us common ratio R, right? And one scenario is this. And if it, another scenario says, Mr. A's salary is 115% of the preceding year, or let's uh, change it to 112% in this case. Mr. A's salary is 112% of the preceding year. If the preceding year, salary is multiplied by 112% will directly be getting the new salary. This means this 112% is already the percentage that is given to us. This means the examiner has already added 100% and already added 12% to the original 100% to give us 112%. So this means we need not add 100% to it. This entire value that is given by the examiner itself is the common ratio. And this is 1.12. So one scenario in which common ratio can be found by adding or uh, subtracting the given percentage and one scenario in which the per given percentage itself is the common ratio and we need not add or subtract anything from it, right? So whenever the percentages are involved, this would mean that the given question is a geometric progression question. Are we clear with it or any confusions that you have over here? I need acknowledgement. Right, take the screenshot of it and then I'll uh, move to the top once again if, to see if anything is left. Yes, this was the entire thing. We have covered some of, some of first hand terms. We have covered some to infinity. We have then covered the concept of convergence, right? We have also uh, taken an example of sum to infinity to find the sum to infinity. And we have covered everything about percentages as well, right? So we are clear with uh, geometric progression. We have covered every single detail about geometric progression, right? If you have not taken the screenshot, I'm giving five seconds. You can take the screenshot, then we are moving to the past with the question. So if you want to ask something about conversion, you can definitely ask. Might be I can explain that in one or two minutes to you. If you're not clear, what confusion are you facing in conversion? Can you uh, open your mic? I, and tell I me? just uh, uh, I was trying to understand it, but I didn't get uh, 
what was going on. It just seemed a little confusing to me because there's like a timeline with like minus one, zero and one. And like, can you just uh, give me a quick recap? Definitely I can. So uh, just give me an example. I'm just giving you an example. Uh, in mathematics, if uh, I, I give you a certain number, let's suppose I'm giving you a number 15, right? And if you're going to multiply this 15 by a certain value, and if this certain value is greater than one, so the second term that you are going to obtain will be greater than 15 or lesser than 15. Like if I'm going to multiply 15 by 1.5, or if I'm going to multiply 15 by two or three, any number that is greater than one, then 15 is multiplied by that number. Let's suppose the number is 1.5, any number that is greater than one, right? The, uh, the rule of mathematics, the principle of mathematics is that if any number is multiplied by a number that is greater than one or lesser than negative one, like I'm talking about these regions, about these, this region and this region, then the, the next term would be greater than the previous term. So let's focus on positivity as, as of now. I'm just focusing on positive. So if I'm multiplying 1.5 by 15, the answer is 22.5. This means the new term that we have obtained is greater than the old term. The new term 22.5 is greater than the old term, which is 15. But if the number is 15 and we multiply it by 0 0.5, then the old term was 15 and the new term is 7.5. This means new term is less than old term. Now what is happening? In the second example, because the common ratio R, the value lies between negative one and one, because it lies between negative one and one. What is happening is that every subsequent term is less than the previous term. Now when every subsequent term is less than the previous term, now what ultimately is happening is a time will come when the, the, every subsequent term will keep on decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. When the terms keeps on decreasing, 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 a, time, a point will come that if we are going to add that tiny uh, term, like a small term to the sum, it will not create much difference. The concept is when the common ratio is between negative one and one, then the every subsequent term that is coming is getting lower and lower and lower and lower. And it's getting so low that if you are going to add that to the sum of all the terms, and if I'm going to add that term to obtain the sum of all terms, then that particular term will not be creating a significant difference. And that is why there's a cap and the sum will not go beyond that cap, right? So that is why if the common ratio is between negative one and one, every subsequent term will get keep on getting smaller and smaller and smaller because it's a rule of mathematics that if uh, we multiply the previous term by a number which is between negative one and one, number will keep on getting decrease it will keep on decreasing 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 a time will come it will become very near to zero and it, that would be the time when we can say that it is negligible hence it can be right uh, a bit of clarification that has been given Musa, anything yeah right. sir i completely understand now <laughs> thank you perfect 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 perfect, perfect. so we are, we are moving uh, forward towards the past right uh, let's look at the first question of the past papers. I'll be uh, looking at a few questions that I think uh, can clear your concepts because my objective is that uh, in the class that you take, I can clear as much as possible, right? So that uh, that R of yours is utilized very wisely. So let's move forward and let's start the first question. It's a big question. It's a 10 mark question of uh, geometric and arithmetic progression combined. Both the things are combined in this first question. So it's, it's definitely a good question for us. The first term of an arithmetic progression is eight and the common difference is D. Now everything, uh, one strategy that, the, that a student should follow is we should be clearly writing everything so that we do not have to read the question once again. Uh, in AP, the first term is eight and the common difference is D. The first term, the fifth term, and the eighth term of this arithmetic 
step progression are the first term, the second term, and the third term, respectively, of a geometric progression. Now, now these lines are very important. The examiner is saying that we have one sequence arithmetic progression. It is a first term, it is a fifth term, and it is an eighth term. Now, the examiner is then telling us about GP. The first term, the fifth term, and the eighth term of this AP are the first, second, and third of a GP. This means first term of AP is going to be same as first term of GP. This, what does this mean? As the first term of AP is eight, this means the first term of GP is also eight. Then the fifth term of AP, and that is, what is the formula of fifth, fifth term? A plus N minus one D, A plus five minus one D, which is A plus four D. And the second term of GP, which is A R power N minus one, A R power two minus one, which is A R. Now the second term and fifth term, the fifth term of AP and the second term of GP are equal, are same. So this means A plus four D, would be equals to AR. The fifth term of AP is A plus 4D. The second term of GP is AR. And examiner is saying both of them are equal. This means A plus 4D equals AR. We already have the value of A, which is eight. So this means eight plus 4D equals eight R. So one data is this. Now let's move forward. The eighth term of the AP, which is a plus n minus 1d, it would be a plus 7d. Then the third term of GP, which is going to be ar n minus 1 ar squared. Now the examiner is saying both of them are equal. This means that a plus 7d is equal to ar squared. Now we already have a, which is 8. 8 plus 7d is equal to 8r squared. Now here we have the second equation. Now if you are going to simplify the first equation and dividing by four, it would become two plus D is equals to two R. And if you are going to make D the subject, it would be two R minus two. So if we are going to call this equation as the first equation, and if you are going to call the second equation, as a, this as a second equation, then we are going to solve the two equations simultaneously to give us D and R. So let's do that. Substitute equation one into equation two. Eight plus seventy d is two r minus two is equals to eight r square. So I'm going to simplify eight plus fourteen r minus fourteen is equals to eight r square. If you're going to shift everything to one side, then eight r square eight minus fourteen is negative six, which move to that side would become positive six minus 14R plus six is equal to zero. And if you're going to simplify it by dividing it by two, it would become four R squared minus seven R plus three is equal to zero. Now let's middle term breaking. Uh, either we have to do middle term breaking. Always remember that working must be shown. We cannot use the calculator directly because at times teachers, teachers, teachers teach us that we can use the calculator directly to find the value of R, but examiner is very strict about it. Uh, method must be shown and the two common methods are uh, middle term breaking which we call basically factorization or it can be a quadratic formula that we can use so i'm middle term breaking over here 4 r square 4 3 is a 12 minus 4 r minus 3 r plus 3 equals 0 if you're going to take 4 r as common it would become r minus 1 pairing it minus 3 common r minus 1 equals 0 as we have two values of r, r equals to one or r equals to three upon four. So we are getting two values, but we have to reject one. Now, which one going to be rejected? We already know that r can never be negative one, zero or one. So this means in this question, if r is one, it's not practically possible. This means we have to reject it. And the only value of r that we will be giving is three upon four. And r is three upon four. And if, if we are going to find d, then it would be two multiplied by r, which is three upon four minus two. Now three upon two minus two is negative 0 0.5, which is negative half. 
So the common difference that we have found is negative half. The answers that we were to give, uh, the examiner asked us write down two equations connecting D and R. We have already given two equations. Hence, we had to show R was three upon four. We successfully showed, and then we have to show that value of D was to be found, and we have successfully found the value of D. So here, here we are done with the first part. As far as second part is concerned, we have to find the sum to infinity. The formula for sum to infinity is a upon one minus r. We have already found a. We already had a as eight, and we have the common ratio r, which is three upon four. We can just just substitute, and we can secure the two marks, which are of free marks. Basically, the first part was the most important one. This part two and the part three were the free marks. So if anyone has a and r, the second part can be done. Then third. Find the sum of the first eight terms of the arithmetic progression. You are already clear with the arithmetic sum formula. Uh, you can use the arithmetic term formula n upon two, two a plus n minus one d, substituting a, n, and d. And uh, instead of n, you'll be substituting eight. A and d you already have. Just substitute to get the answer. The part two and part three are free. So if someone has secured the six first, first six marks, then securing the last four marks was very simple. Right. Just take a screenshot and give an acknowledgement as to whether you have been able to understand this question or not. Right, so are we clear with it? Chat, acknowledge, please acknowledge whenever I say now. So I need acknowledgement on chat. Perfect. All right, let's uh, discuss this question. Uh, question number three. What's wrong with question number two? Then we can do two as well. Let's go in sequence. A progression has a second term of 96 and a fourth term of 54. Now, when the examiner has said a progression, we are not very clear as to whether it's arithmetic progression or geometric progression. So that is why the examiner has said, find the first term of the progression in each of the following cases. The first part is a different one, and the second part is a different one. The first part says, if the progression is arithmetic progression, then find the first term. So basically, we have to find the first term. Now the data is uh, given. The second term is 96. The fourth term is 54, and we have to find the first term if the progression is arithmetic. The second term is basically a plus d. A plus d equals 96. The fourth term is a plus 3d, which equals 54. If we are going to solve the two equations simultaneously, we'll get a and d. Similarly. If the progression is geometric with a positive common ratio, the second term is 96. This means AR is 96. The fourth term is 54. This means AR cube is 54. If we are going to solve the two equations simultaneously, we'll get the answer. <coughs> Might be uh, it can create a problem, so I'm just solving it over here. Let's make A the subject, which is 96 upon R. This is the first equation. Let's take it a second equation. Let's substitute the first equation in the second one. In place of a, we'll substitute 96 upon r, and it will be r cube equals to 54. It will become r square is equals to 54 upon 96. And if you are going to take the square root, then square root would mean plus minus both will come because whenever we are going to take square root, uh, we'll get plus and minus both. But over here, we do not have to take a negative one. Why? Because it has been specified by the examiner. That the common ratio is positive. That is why we do not have to uh, apply the negative rule. The common ratio would here be three upon four. Square root of fifty-four upon ninety-six. Once common ratio is obtained, we can substitute in equation number one to find that uh, the the positive common uh, the first term ninety-six upon three upon four, which in this case would be one twenty-eight. Right. We are done with question number two as well. Are we clear with it?
take a screenshot so that we can move forward. Any, any, anything, 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 anything. Uh, let's not get confused. Let's focus on the third question. The ninth uh, term of an arithmetic progression is 22 and the sum of the first four terms is 49. Now we can look at this question that the ninth term is, uh, the examiner is talking about AP. The ninth term is 22. The sum of four terms is 49. Right, find the first term and the common difference. Ninth term is 22. This means a plus 8d is equal to 22. The sum of four terms is 49, and we should be knowing the sum of uh, formula, which is n upon 2, 2a plus n minus 1d, n is 4, d is not known, equals 49. Uh, we'll be forming the two equations. We are going to solve the two equations simultaneously and we'll be getting the value of the first term and the common difference. The first part is done. <coughs> and the second part says, the nth term of the progression is 46. Find the value of n. So if the nth term is 46, this means nth term is 46. This means a plus n minus 1d is given as 46. We have already found A, we have already found D. If we are going to substitute A and D, and if we are going to make N the subject, then we'll get the answer of N. Part one and part two were very simple. Let's look at question number four. Uh, question number four, find the sum of all the multiples of five between 100 and 300 inclusive. Find the sum of all the multiples of 5 between 100 and 300 inclusive. Uh, now, the first thing that we need to decide over here is this part A, a geometric progression question or an arithmetic progression question. So, can some of you highlight as to whether it's a, a GP question or AP question? I need uh, your suggestion in the chat box. Malik, waiting for your answer. What do you think? Is it a geometric progression or a arithmetic progression? Musa has already given his answer. Very good, Malik. Musa, it's not a geometric one. It's an arithmetic one. Uh, Malik, can you explain how come it's arithmetic? And if you are going to solve it using arithmetic progression, then what will be the method that you will follow? Part two, part B is a very simple one. Uh, we have to discuss part A particularly. Find the sum of all the multiples of five between 100 and 300 inclusive. Are you clear with the approach? Do you, can you suggest me what will be the approach over here? When Musa read the term multiples, when a student, when any student reads the term multiples, then by multiplying the concept of geometric progression pops up. The sir, sir tell, told us that uh, multiplication division is GP, and that is why the student recalls that multiples is written. This means it's a GP question. However, it's multiples of five. It's not written that a value two is being multiplied by the number previous number to give us the new number. Had that been written, it would have been a geometric progression question, but it's multiples of five. Now just recall multiples of five, five, 10, 15, the table of five, 20, 25, 30. Now what is happening? Are we multiplying certain number? Are we multiplying a ratio by the previous number to give us the second term? No, if you are going to obtain the second term, we are adding five. And again, we are adding five. And again, we are adding five. When we are talking about the table of five, then five is being added. When we are talking about the table of 10, then 10 is being added. If we are talking about the multiples of a certain number, then the table uh, the, the table of that particular number would mean that it's an AP question. In this particular scenario, 
because we have been told that the first term is 100 and the last term is 300 inclusive. This means that the first term is 100 and the last term is 300. Because uh, the common difference over here is five, right? And we have to find the sum of all the multiples. Now, the first thing is that the word is all. Do we know what is the meaning of all? What the examiner is giving us, all term. Now, are we sure what all means? No, if you're going to apply the sum formula, we would be needing the value of n because it's n upon two, two a plus n minus one d. So if we don't have n, how can we find the sum of n terms? So this means the first thing that we need is n. So in arithmetic progression, you must be very clear that if we have the last term, we can find the value of n. The, for, the formula for last term is same as the formula for nth term, a plus n minus one d. If we have a l last term is 300, first term is 100, n minus 1d, the common difference is 5. Now, using this formula, we can find n. 300 divided by 100, uh, sorry, 300 minus 100 divided by 5 plus 1, n is 41. Now, when s, n is 41, and if you have to find the sum of 41 terms, then it would be 41 upon 2, 2a plus 41 minus 1 into d, which is 5. And here we can find the formula. Uh, here we can find the answer. 2 into 100 plus 40 into 5 multiplied by 41 divided by 2. The answer is 8200. Sum of 42, sum of 41 terms is 8200. This means that if examiner has not specified the number of terms, but the last term is given, then we use the last term to find the number of terms. And when the number of terms have been obtained, then only can we find the sum of all the terms, right? The part A was particularly important. That is why I discussed over here. Are we clear with it? Take a screenshot, give your acknowledgement. Alhamdulillah, we have successfully completed the topic. Uh, geometric provision explanation has been done in detail. And along with the past paper questions, we have covered first four questions as well. I, I have covered as much as I could. I'm definitely sure that you might be uh, able to understand whatever has been delivered in this, this class. Thank you for your time. See you in the next class. Stay blessed.